Hello and a really warm welcome to our first of our sort of winter series of webinars. You're very kindly joining us by Zoom. Uh, we're just going to mark time slightly to, until our Facebook live viewers watch us, but we're delighted to, to welcome you to this webinar on rider balance and how it affects your horse's way of going. Um, as I say, this is the first of the winter series. We're going to run them fortnightly through the winter, um, November, December, January, and February. And a, a second welcome to everyone who's joining us by Facebook Live. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this latest uh, World Horse Welfare webinar on rider balance and how it affects a horse's way of going. Um, this is, as, as I've mentioned just to our Zoom viewers, this is the first in a series of winter webinars and we'll, tonight is affecting uh, uh, looking at rider balance and horse performance. And the aim of these is to be informative and help us as owners be better owners and riders. And I'm delighted tonight to be welcoming, or today to be welcoming, Dr. Russell McKechnie-Guire, who's a leading expert in equine biomechanics and I know will be known to, to many of you, as will Richard Davison. International dressers, rider and coach, four-time Olympian, um, European medalist, and possibly most importantly of all, a World Horse Welfare trustee. And also delighted to, to, well, to be joined also by Tony Tyler, who's a, a, the Deputy Chief Executive for World Horse Welfare. So as before, these webinars are very much about a two-way conversation. So when we get to the questions, we'll really want to, to, to get interaction from you. Um, if you're joining us by Zoom, then if you can use the Q&A function to submit your questions, that'd be brilliant. By all means, chat amongst yourselves on the chat function. But if you've got a question, please do uh, put them on the Q&A function. And if you're on Facebook, then please use the comments function. Um, if you're on uh, Facebook, then please do share the live video and just remember that all our webinars, tonight's webinar and all the previous ones are on our YouTube channel um, and you'll uh, be able to play back and also share that with your friends and colleagues uh, uh, as well. And as I mentioned, we're doing these through the, the winter as well, having started them last June. And so if you've got any subjects, topics that you think we should be covering for our webinars, then please do um, email us on education at worldhorsewelfare.org. Um, as I already mentioned, we're running them every second Wednesday through to um, um, February and our next webinar is going to be on the 17th of November um, and it's on how to resist peer pressure and what to do what what and do what's right for your horse how to resist peer pressure and do what right for your horse is with Pippa Funnel um, and so please we've just put in the chat function there um, an, an option to sign up uh, for that webinar but on to tonight um, I'm delighted to be joined by Russell and he's going to kick off with a 30 minute presentation and talk about how right Rider balance affects, his, uh, affects a horse's way of going. Then we're going to welcome Richard and Tony into the conversation. We'll have a small structured Q&A um, before really then opening it up to, to the audience. And that's where very much you come in. And we will ask for as many of you, we'll get through as many of those questions that you submit as possible. Now, I'm just going to share my screen. And um, I've obviously started on the wrong uh you would have thought after doing all of this time, I would get it right. So how does rider balance affect a horse's way of going? That's tonight's webinar. Um, just as a plug, next week, uh, and it very much links into the, the, the webinar we've got in two weeks' time, but next week, it's the World Horse Welfare Annual Conference. Um, and there's a link there, and we'll put it in the chat function as well. And you can sign up, and then you'll be able to, to watch that live uh, on Remembrance Day, starting at 945 running through till about three o'clock and it's all around whose opinion matters and as we know within the equine world there are plenty of opinions but who do we listen to and there's a great selection of speakers there so please do register online and join us virtually next Thursday. Now before um, I introduce Russell I just wanted to get for those of you joining us by Zoom to ho hopefully get you to interact a bit. There is no right or wrong answer here it's just to sort of get a little bit of interaction and to ask a question if you ride has anyone ever told you that you are crooked or don't ride in balance? Um, very simple answer two choices yes and no. As I say so please do whilst you're um, uh, 
answering that question. I'm just going to introduce a little bit about World Horse Welfare. M many of you will be very familiar, founded in 1927, so we're building towards our centenary in 2027. And at the heart of what World Horse Welfare is all about is to promote a caring and pragmatic uh, but, uh, uh, and practical approach to equine welfare. And as part of that, we support the responsible use of horses in sport. And we're currently working in 16 low and middle income, in, income countries across the world uh, where, where, anim, where horses are still used and equines are still used as working animals. So tonight is all about um, a, a topic to support us, as especially as riders. And uh, so tonight's webinar is all about the effect of rider balances and horses' performance. And so what we're going to talk about and cover during this session is how horse movement is affected by carrying a balanced rider and someone who is not so balanced. We're going to look at what the most common rider faults are and we're, how riders can tell if they are unbalanced and if they are, what they can do about it. So now, Basil, before I introduce Russell, can you give us the results of, of the poll? There you go. So uh, four-fifths of you have been told in the, uh, uh, over the course of your time that you do ride crooked. So um, I, I wonder how many of you still think you ride crooked, but at least that is great to see. Uh, thank you for engaging in that. And to help us, whether you ride crooked or you don't think you ride crooked, I am delighted to introduce Russell, who, you know, as the slide reflects, is extremely experienced um, in equine biomechanics ever since he graduated um, nearly 20 years ago. He's currently researching horse saddle rider interaction and the effects of rider asymmetry on equine back movement. And re there really couldn't be some better, somebody better qualified to, to introduce tonight's topic. What you might not know about um, Russell is that he loves lime green, the colour lime green. You see it in that lanyard there. You might see it in a few of his um, uh, the, the PowerPoint slides coming up shortly. Shortly. Everything in his house is lime green, including his Christmas tree, but he refused to tell us whether his Christmas tree is already up. But I did a little bit of research around lime green. It's associated with nature, confidence and high energy. And anyone who knows Russell will know that that is exactly uh, the, the, the type of person that Russell is. It really does describe him well. So, Russell, uh, the floor is yours. That's great. Thank you for that introduction. So I'll just share my my screen. OK, that's all looking good. Your end, Roly. All good to go. Great. Hello, everybody. And uh, thank you, World Horse Welfare, for um, that introduction and for inviting me the, this evening to um, present to you, um, as already introduced, uh, how does ride a balance affect horses way of going? So I have 30 minutes and uh, that's what we're going to tackle tonight and to, to really just try and understand the complexities of horse saddle rider interaction. Uh, and so here you have a video um, of, a, of a rider uh, on a horse uh, and they're cantering on the centre line. And if we were live, I would be asking you what, what you see, um, but sadly we're, we're not live. So I'll describe what uh, the general comments are that uh, are, are um, reported, uh, we see a rider collapsing through the right side or shifting their hips out to the left. Um, quite often uh, people say that the left stirrup would look longer uh, or indeed that the rider is twisting. And really, as Rowley mentioned, um, I'm quite scared that it's nearly 20 years, but for the last 15 years, we have been uh, studying the interaction between the horse, saddle and rider and really trying to unpick uh, some of the complexities around how the, the system, the horse rider saddle system works. And um, that's really what I want to, to get across um, this evening. Before we do that, and as you can see, uh, the lime green slides, um, but before we do that, I just want to give a, an overview, a very brief overview of, um, of equine boat biomechanics, the locomotor system of the horse. I just have a, a skeleton here, and this is just to outline the vertebral column. We've got the cervical, and then here the thoracic, and uh, here the lumbar, sacral, and then the cockadiel. Um, and this is the this area here, these vertebrae are the, are the, um, I've been studying for the last 15 years, because as you will see, that's largely, of course, where the saddle and rider um, is positioned on, on the horse. 
Now, what you may not be or may be aware of or may not be aware of, um, the horse uh, doesn't have a bony connection connecting the forelimb uh, to the horse's trunk. Uh, so what that means is that the horse doesn't have a collarbone. Uh, so the forelimb is simply attached to the horse's trunk. So here we have the scapula and the humerus. So here's the forelimb on the left and right. Uh, and here you see these are the soft tissues and we're gonna define these this evening as the thoracic sling musculature, um, but there is no bony connection connecting the, the forelimb to the trunk. And that really is one of the unique uh, features of the, of the locomotor system. Now, if you've seen me present before, you would have heard me say this sentence and I make no apologies, but the horse is a miracle of bioengineering. It really is. The Formula One car has nothing on this quadruped. It really is a, an amazing quadruped. And what I want to just present to you here is an appreciation for the forces that are acting on the horse. Um, in walk, the forces that are going through the forelimb is equivalent to the horse's body weight. In trot, the forces going through the horse's um, forelimb is equivalent to the horse's body weight. And in canter, it increases to 1.5 times the horse's body weight. And it's uh, particularly in the trailing forelimb of the canter sequence. And when we get to gallop, it can, be, it can increase to two to two and a half times the body weight. And the key bit I want to emphasize here is this is through the forelimbs. So, and every motion cycle, um, this is occurring. So sometimes people think, oh, well, half a body weight, that's, that's okay, that's a lot. But this is every stride your horse takes. So every, if you think of when you're trotting, cantering, schooling around the arena, how many strides you take, well, at every stride, there's a force coming up through those horses' forelimbs. And to give you some context, the human body, the human bones would not be able to withstand these forces. We would just shatter. And the only species uh, that can is the ostrich, um, but we tend not to ride ostriches, um, and the camel. Um, they, they have similar capacity for, for um, abs force absorption. So in some gates, it's equivalent of a ton of bricks going through the horse's front limb, the strut, every stride. And as I say, this is a, an important point that this is every stride. <clears throat> So what about the forces acting on the horse's back? So we've talked a little bit about the forces that are coming up and I'm gonna talk about those a bit more in detail. Um, but every time when we get on the horse's back, we apply a force um, and in walk, that force is equivalent to the rider's body mass. So here I've got a, a picture of a rider uh, or human, I should say. Um, so equivalent in walk is equivalent to the rider's body mass. In trot, that increases to two times the rider's body mass. And in canter, it increases further to two and a half times the rider's body mass. So when you're trotting around on your horses, um, you will be applying a force two times your body mass. And the key bit here again, every stride. In canter, every canter stride you take is equivalent to 2.5 times your body mass. Um, so I think when we start to understand the forces that are coming up and the forces that are coming down, it really highlights the, the need um, for correct rider biomechanics, correct balance, or optimal balance, I should say, because you hopefully I'm presenting to you here that the, the impact or the forces associated um, with locomotion and, um, and ridden exercise. So this is a video here courtesy of um, Professor Hilary Clayton from the Michigan lab. Um, and then the pictures up here are um, the structure and motion lab at the Royal Veterinary College. And these are force plates here. Um, so you see in, uh, there's seven here and horses will trot and walk and trot and sometimes canter over these. Um, and what these are doing is they're measuring the ground reaction forces. And what you see in this video is an animation of a horse trotting over the force plates. And you see some red lines going towards the top of your screen. And this is the force vector. Um, we're not gonna go into detail on forces tonight, but what I wanted to just show you is how we determine the amount of forces that are coming up 
uh, the determine, sorry, the ground reaction forces um, uh, during locomotion. Now, if you've been uh, on my previous webinars, um, you will hear me say that you are all going to become graph experts by the end of this evening's uh, uh, module or course. Um, but what I wanted to show you here is the effect that the rider has on a trotting horse. Um, so here on the left, I present to you um, data from the Michigan lab. Um, and here I present the peak vertical force for the forelimb on the left, and here on the right, the peak vertical force for the hind limb. And on the vertical axis here, we've got force, so naught to eight, that's representing the force. And on the horizontal axis here, I've got the percentage of stance. Now, the stance is when the hoof is grounded, it comes into contact with the, the ground, is loaded, and then uh, leaves the ground. That whole time that the, the hoof touches the ground till it leaves the ground is referred to as the stance phase. And that's what I'm presenting here, percentage of stance. And the green line represents the data, the vertical forces of the horses trotting in hand. And the gray silver line represents the vertical forces of the horses when ridden in trot, so with a rider on. And what you can see is that the peak vertical force is greater um, for the ridden condition. So when we have the weight of the rider on the horse, the vertical forces in the forelimb are increased. And if I take you now to the right, you can see I present here the peak vertical forces for the hind limb. And you can see that yes, there is a slight increase um, with the rider condition, but it's not as significant as the forelimb. So let's just take a little half halt here. Um, I've already described that the horse's forelimb is not attached to the horse's trunk by bony connection, it's attached by soft tissue. I've already um, described that across all gates, walk, trot, canter, gallop, and indeed jumping, the uh, vertical forces are highest for the forelimb. And now I'm presenting to you that when we add the rider on the mass of the rider uh, in trot it's equivalent to two times the rider's body mass and in canter it's equivalent to two and a half times the rider's body mass every stride and here I present to you that when we've added the rider on in trot we're actually in, we're, we're increasing those forces sig significantly in the forelimb um, compared to the hind limb again, highlighting the need and the importance of correct rider biomechanics and balance. And of course, uh, training saddle fit, which we'll touch on at the, at the very end. So here, I just wanted to show you some videos. I'll just show you this first one here. Um, this is a, um, a appliance uh, pressure mapping system, which you may have seen before. Uh, this is the left side of the saddle, and this is the right side of the saddle. Um, and what we have here is a pressure scale. Um, dark is zero, oh, sorry, black is zero, uh, and then the pink is seven, um, which is representing here the PSI, pounds per square inch. Um, and what this allows us to do is measure in real time the amount of pressure um, that's beneath the saddle. Uh, and we have other mats that we've uh, published data on for girths, bridles, etc. Um, but what I wanted to just, the reason I put them in, uh, these videos in, I'll play all of them now. So top right, we have seated canter. Um, the bottom one, we have standing canter. What I wanted to show you was, is that the pressures beneath the saddle are, are transient, they're dynamic, they alter with riding position. So if we think of a rider that is leaning to one side, that will be reflected in the saddle pressures. Likewise, a rider that is leaning forward, that will be reflected in the saddle pressures. So I thought it was just useful to see these um, videos to, to really understand that wherever, wherever our position is will have an effect on saddle pressures. But also what's really important to understand is that you may be able to see from the small video of the horse that these pressures are largely influenced 
by the dynamics, by the locomotion of the horse. So every time the limb comes in contact with the ground, there's an increase in pressure um, beneath the saddle. So we've got pressures, forces coming up, as I've already described, the ground reaction forces. We've got forces coming down, as I've described with the rider um, weight, and, and now they're sandwiched between the saddle. And here, I think you can see how the saddle um, manages those forces or how those uh, pressures change as a result of riding position. So I'm not going to talk too much about uh, back biomechanics, but I wanted to put this slide in because this is uh, our current area of research where, where we're looking um, particularly at how the rider affects the horse's spinal movement. Um, now, another little half halt. Um, I've described already that the forelimb has the highest forces. Uh, and then when we add the rider on, those forces increase further. Um, but what I want to just now add into the picture, the mix, is the forces from the forelimbs and the head and neck are transmitted to the cranial thoracic spine. So if you remember the skeleton picture I showed you at the beginning, um, we had the cervical vertebra up here, the neck, and then we've got here the thoracic vertebra and, and then the lumbar. So this area here is responsible for managing those forces coming up, as I've described, uh, and I've put a square around the area um, that the rider is sitting. And so you can see that where the rider is sitting is responsible for a huge amount of force transmission from the ground and also coming down. Again, highlighting the importance of that, the rider's position. So, um, we did a study um, some time ago now where we asked um, uh, uh, experienced advanced riders to sit on a pressure mat, uh, the pliance pressure mat that you've seen already, um, and we asked them to say when they felt straight or sitting evenly, symmetrical, and this is what we found, that we found significantly more pressure on the left seat bone versus the, or the left seat versus the right. Um, and just to confirm that this, these riders, these athletes confirmed that they were sitting level, sitting straight, symmetrical, but indeed their symmetry um, had a bias towards the left. So my question there is, then this is the next part of the study is, does rider asymmetry off horse translate on horse? And that's something that we're, we're quite keen to, to understand further. So, there's, uh, I wanted to now um, talk to you or present to you one of our latest projects that uh, um, I think will be interesting in the, in the context of this evening about the importance of rider position. Um, this study, we um, use these sensors. So these are inertial measuring units and we position them, as you can see, um, on the midline of the horse's um, back. Um, and beneath the saddle. So we were measuring spinal range of motion, motion back movement um, with and without a rider. And what I want to present to you this evening is actually different positions um, in trot. So as I said, you're all going to become gra um, graph experts and I hope inspired to embrace lime green because there's a lot of lime green. Um, but here, what I want to show you here is the pitch. Um, so I'm going to define this as flexion, extension. So flexion, extension, flexion, extension. And on the vertical axis, we've got degrees. And on the horizontal axis, we've got in-hand trot. And rising trot represented the, by the grey bar and rising trot on the incorrect diagonal represented here by the uh, purple bar, and then two point position. Now, just to confirm, two point position is where the rider is standing up in the irons and they take their center of mass forward. And then I've located here, this is um, approximately where we're sitting. So this is where we're sitting. T5 to T13, which would be the, the thoracic vertebra that I mentioned a moment ago. And then this is behind the saddle. What I just want to really highlight is uh, that you can see compared to the green bar, which is in hand, 
that there is a change in back movement when in rising trot on the correct diagonal or incorrect diagonal. And the thing that I really want to highlight is you see that when you go into two point position, that that change is more obvious where we're sitting. So that region beneath the saddle. And I we published this now, but I, I think it's really useful to, to be alternating your position um, on the horse, um, particularly to see if there's any change in back movement. And when I come on to some symmetry data in a moment, um, maybe you'll think a little bit about two point position um, being a benefit in, in training. So now I present to you the um, roll. So that's a little bit left to right axial rotation. And we've got the same uh, format on the vertical axis, degrees uh, on the horizontal axis, T5, T13, T13, T18, et cetera. And you can see that we, compared to trotting in hand, the presence of a rider, regardless of position, has a decreased range of motion. So why would that be? Why would the horse decrease its range of motion beneath the saddle in this direction? Well, I haven't proved it yet, or I haven't shown it experimentally, but my working hypothesis is that I've already presented to you that the forces coming up um, are increased with a rider and they're the highest in the falling, um, regardless of gait. And uh, so I speculate, I hypothesize that the horse is, has a stabilizing mechanism, the rider and saddle has a stabilizing mechanism um, as a result of the increased forces that are being created as a, present, as a result of the rider. And that's something that we're really interested in trying to, to understand further. So I want to hear talk a little bit about symmetry um, a movement symmetry and again what I've got here is uh, in hand trot rising trot uh, on the correct diagonal incorrect diagonal and two point position and you can see that we've got levels of asymmetry these horses I should say were all elite show jumping horses um, and all ridden by the same rider so that was how we standardized the rider effect um, but what I want to now show you is that you can see that across all conditions, when we are in rising trot on the correct or incorrect diagonal, this actually induced asymmetry in the horse's movement when trotting. But when we look at the two point position, the horses, so this is the yellow bar, the horses were trotting more symmetrically. Now, I think this is really important to understand um, or to, to consider when we're training our horses, those that ride on the incorrect diagonal, what effect does that have on the horse's locomotion? Likewise, um, those that maybe just do hacking or pleasure riding, the horses will put riders on a preferred diagonal, preferred rising diagonal. And it's really important in training that we consider the effect that the diagonals have on the, on the horse's symmetry. And based on this data and our colleagues in Europe, I would be in support of including two point position as a means to improve one rider balance, but two horses symmetry. Because I think what we're seeing here is that two point position can help improve equine um, symmetry pat patterns um, when trotting. So a little bit to now looking at some of the things we see a lot. Um, and again, if I was live, I would be asking you, what do you see? Um, but it's been shown from our colleagues in, in Europe um, that riders who collapse one hip, and this is the image that was in the uh, manuscript, and this was defined as a right hip collapse, um, that the pressures are increased uh, on the left side. So if the rider collapses the right side, the saddle pressures are increased on the left side. Now, they're only increased by 1.5 newtons, which isn't a huge amount. But remember, 
this is every stride and i think sometimes we we forget that that every stride the horse takes there's a ground reaction force there's a dynamic force of the rider and if that rider or that unit is asymmetric i.e collapsing one hip then the saddle pressures as you see here will be asymmetric every stride and i have a saying that i've published multiple times that horses will develop a locomotor strategy to alleviate any discomfort caused, whether it's by the saddle, the girth, the bridle, and in the context of this evening, by the rider. And the same research group also looked at uh, riders that lean to one side. So uh, a one degree tilting of the upper body increase the forces on the same side by 1.4 newtons. So the summary here is that if you collapse one through your hip, you increase the pressures on the opposite side underneath the saddle. If you lean to one side, you increase the pressures on the same side. In summary, again, the horse will develop a strategy. These pressures are consistent every stride. And something else I see quite a lot is riders leaning forward, um, possibly for, for, um, for, uh, because they're, they're nervous or um, they have uh, tightness, asymmetries in their own position. But of course, if the rider leans forward, what are we going to do? Increase the vertical forces that I described at the very beginning of this evening's talk. And as a strategy, riders will become tight in their knee and thigh. Remember I said that the horse doesn't have a bony connection connecting the forelimb to the trunk. And so as the rider grips with the knee and thigh, this can restrict the forelimb's limb movement. So the protraction, how much it comes forward and also the retraction phase during the swing phase. So to really go back to what tonight is about, the, the rider balance is absolutely essential um, to try and understand and try and optimize. And here, just to show you some pressure readings, um, a rider leaning forward increases the pressures at the, the front of the saddle, a rider in a more uh, neutral position, and likewise, a rider leaning back, the pressures are at the back of the saddle. And remember I said, these pressures are transient, every stride and your position will influence saddle pressure distribution, along with the locomotion pattern, locomotor pattern of the horse. So I just want to wrap up with one project uh, we, we published a, a, a last year, but we collected a little while ago. Um, and this was where we um, induced rider asymmetry. So what we did in this study was we shortened one stirrup um, by five centimeters. Uh, and so we started with symmetrical riders um, and they were assessed by a physio, uh, et cetera. And we shortened one stirrup um, by five centimeters. And you see that here. So this is our symmetrical rider. Um, and then here we've shortened one stirrup by, as I say, five centimeters. And we recorded all sorts of measurements. We recorded joint movement of the horse, the rider, um, and spinal movement, which is what I'd like to um, show you this evening. So I mentioned about symmetry and that, that's a key, you know, we want to create an ambidextrous athlete, that being the horse and the rider. So symmetry is, is, is a, is a, a key component in um, performance or training. And just to summarize here, the, the gray bars represent the symmetrical stirrups and the green bars represent the asymmetrical stirrups. And I think it's clear to see that with the rider who is asymmetrical, that we have an increase in asymmetry of the horse. Um, so by shortening the stirrup by five centimeters, we induced asymmetry in the horse. And if you remember back to um, what I said a moment ago about the, I'll go on to the next one, um, about the um, axial rotation that the riders and the saddle, the horse seems to stiffen or stabilize the um, region that the rider is sitting. And I believe, I speculate, I need to carry on more evidence on this, that that is a strategy to 
provide dynamic stability, you'll see here that with the asymmetrical rider, we actually got an increase. So in contrast to what we presented earlier, rider asymmetry seems to have a destabilizing effect um, on the horse's locomotion. And what's also interesting here, just to, to note that we looked at limb loading also, and rider asymmetry affected the limb loading, how much the front and the hind limb were being loaded. And we actually found that with the asymmetrical riders, when we shorten the left stirrup, they increase the load on the right front limb and right hind limb. And the summary really here is, is that the rider asymmetry as you'd expect, affects back movement um, and also the, the limbs that are attached to the back, all four of them are influenced by the rider's position. So what have we learned this evening? The forelimb has the highest vertical forces across all gates and forelimb forces increase with the weight of a rider. So I presented to you the graph um, where we had the, the rider in trot and there was increase in forces in the forelimb. I've also presented to you this evening that rider position influences back movement, back symmetry and saddle pressure distribution. And, and rider asymmetry, riders that lean forward, lean back or to one side will affect pressure distribution also. And rider asymmetry, I touched on at the end there, will alter back movement and limb loading. Uh, and I think it's, as I mentioned a moment ago, riders are inherently asymmetrical, as are horses. And I think this is really important. Uh, tonight I talked a lot about riders, but it's trying to understand the interface between the horse, the saddle and the rider. So for example, if a horse is pushing more with the right hind than the left hind, that's going to affect the rotation of the horse's back. That's going to have an effect on the movement of the saddle. And as a result, that will have an effect on the dynamics of the rider. Likewise, if we've got a rider that has an asymmetry, that's going to affect the pressures under the saddle and that will affect the locomotion. So it's really important when we look at rider biomechanics that we understand the up and the down and that relationship between the system. I think it is important that riders need to understand and address their own asymmetries in order to optimize this horse rider system. And as I said a moment ago, and hopefully now it's, uh, you, you will agree, horses will develop a locomotor strategy to alleviate any discomfort caused um, here by rider asymmetry as we've, we've discussed. So I thank you for your, um, your time tonight. I thank uh, World Horse Welfare um, for the invitation to present. Before I hand back to um, uh, Roly, I just want to leave you with two things. Um, if you think I'm absolutely bonkers, um, uh, that's okay, I'm cool with that. But just remember these animals can feel a fly. Why can they not feel a rider that is leaning to one side uh, or leaning back or leaning forward? And the answer is they can. They just develop a strategy to compensate. And that strategy is what my passion is, is trying to understand so we can optimize equine health, reduce injury risk and optimize performance. Um, and I really, really, one of the things I love about these evenings is you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink, but you can make it thirsty. And that's my passion to, to make people thirsty to can we do it better? Just ask the question, keeping equine welfare at the, at the front, can we optimize the situation to help our equine athletes? And on that note, I thank you for your time. Russell, that was brilliant. To be honest, I've always thought you were a bit bonkers, but it doesn't mean that that was absolutely brilliant. And there's so much to, to, get, to get involved in there, which I really look forward to during the discussion. So, Russell, thank you. I, was I always get to this stage, and I'm slightly worried when it's very few questions, but they're starting to roll in now. So thank you for that. And do remember, if you're joining us by Zoom, you can upvote questions that are already there. So if your question's already been asked by someone else, just upvote them and that, that will come up to the top of the list and it'll make it mo most likely that I'll be able to, um, to get through to them. So now I'm just going to share my screen 
again and uh, we're going to have our second poll question uh, leading on from the previous one if you like if you ride how likely are you to seek advice on whether you ride in balance and we've got four options there from extremely likely to very unlikely now whilst you're answering those questions i'm going to introduce um our next speaker or our next panelist which is Richard Richard Davison who will be many very well known to you and as um, highlighted on the slide also a World Source Welfare trustee and we're delighted to have him uh, as a trustee uh, provide such good insight for us um, Richard has probably given me the best quirky fact we always uh, ask people involved um, to, to, to give a quirky fact I absolutely love this one um, as we know he's a four-time Olympian I think it was his first Olympics, so he'll confirm in a second. But at Atlanta opening ceremony, like all good athletes, he was very hydrated. And during the opening ceremony where Celine Dion was performing, he got caught short. So he ran backstage uh, to find the necessary facilities. As he came out, he just let out this expletive saying, phew, thank goodness for that, what a relief. Unfortunately, it was exactly the same time Celine Dion, Dion came off stage and she heard exactly what he had said and she, she thought he was talking about a relief that she had stopped singing. He then spent the next couple of minutes convincing her that she really should go back for an encore, which I just thought was lovely. If an equine athlete had ruined the opening Olympics to, to, the, to the Atlanta Olympics, well, done Richard for that I love it and then Tony Tony Tyler who's our own deputy chief executive has been with the charity for for nearly if not 20 years I'm yeah over 20 years um and it has a significant heritage uh, uh, pedigree before World Source Welfare uh, as a rider and as a trainer um Tony's other obsession is running um he he talks about running a lot uh, but to be fair to him he has dressed up as this uh, you could see as Harry the horse and raised money for the charity over the years so good, good on him his most re re recent sort of bonkers thing to do was a, a 50 mile race over the Lake District which he did back in July um his only disappointment he didn't qualify in enough time to be able to do the 100 mile race next year um, so that is that. Uh, Basil, can you give us uh, the answers to the poll just to see? Um, so look at that, you know, almost all of you, uh, which is brilliant. If you write how likely are you to seek advice, you know, 97% of you are extremely, well, two thirds are extremely likely uh, and about a third fairly likely. So that's good. I guess we have a bit of a biased audience uh, with us tonight, um, but that's great. So thank you so much for getting involved in those. Now we're going to move on to uh, a, a brief structured discussion, discussion. And I've got three areas to, to focus on. The first, which is around the effects of suboptimal rider balance on equine welfare and performance. So Richard, if I could come to you first, do you think suboptimal rider balance affects horse welfare? Well, uh, first of all, good evening, everybody. <laughs> um, thank you, Roly, for sharing that lovely secret um, with Celine Dion. Um, Russell, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, yeah, mind boggling, uh, it's great. So coming to the question, Roly, um, does it affect horse welfare? Well, clearly it does. I, I have not, can't say to what degree, because I think it depends how unbalanced somebody is. Uh, but, but clearly it does, because I think Russell has just demonstrated that, well, basically we all have a responsibility to put our load, if we're going to sit on a horse, put our load on that horse as evenly as possible so that the horse can carry us as evenly as possible. I'm not saying it's easy to do, and I think there's a lot of variable factors which we might come on to later, um, but yeah, the, the answer to the question is, in all probability, yes, it does. Excellent. In, in, in cricketing terminology, that was a sort of a, a half folly outside the off stump, which you've dispatched to the boundary extremely effectively. Um, Tony, um, then thinking about a relationship between welfare and performance, do you think that there is a relationship between welfare and performance? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think that... Um, ensuring the horse's optimal welfare that he's balanced when he moves that you help him as much as you can is, is bound to have an influence on performance because if if you are imbalanced and the horse becomes imbalanced 
then he is not going to be able to do his job as well, whether it be dressage, um, going over a jump, or even when it comes to endurance riding, where the differences on the horse's legs over that long period of time that Russell spoke about, time and time again, they're going to feel excessive pressure in one area. Absolutely. And I'm sure you meant um, mares as well as geldings and stallions when you're, you're talking about genders. Uh, but uh, that's great. Thank you, Tony. Um, d- Russell, now sort of getting a bit more to the nub of it. Can rider imbalance affect a horse's risk of lameness? Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to I don't, I don't know is the answer. And uh, I think I hope the asymmetry study I presented, we had increased loading in the forelimb and the hind limb. So the, two, the same side. So if we think about that, that's an overload um, on one side. So over time, yes, that will develop an asymmetry. And what we know is asymmetry can lead to lameness. Yes. Now, can I say that's explicitly right? And no. But I think what we're always trying to do is improve symmetry. And if the rider is asymmetrical to that point, creating asymmetry in the horse, that strategy could possibly lead to lameness. But I don't believe we've got evidence to say, yes, it does directly or from the rider point. So there's not the evidence. And uh, so cause and effect is is difficult to prove. But in your view, there must be. Yeah, If you've got imbalance, does it increase? It, the risk must be increased. Yeah, for it's sure. Logical, isn't it? if, if you got on my sho- shoulders, Roly, and we went for a walk down the road and you leant to the right, I'm going to have to stabilise myself to stop you pulling me to the right. Yeah. Over a period of time, I'm going to have some shortening down one side, some stiffening. The horse is the same, except it has four legs. The, and so the horse will develop a strategy to compensate for the effects that saddle, rider, training, everything has on it. It's just where does that compensation strategy come out later? Yeah, absolutely. And a, a marvellous advantage of having a webinar is I can't get on your horse. <laughs> um, um, Richard, um, does suboptimal rider balance lead to over-reliance on artificial aids, whips, spurs, etc.? Well, the thing about these questions, you know, uh, it depends. Um, It depends how bad the rider is, the lack of balance is. Um, So it's all down to degree. But um, yeah, it certainly, if it isn't all just about balance uh, or the degree of lack of balance, it's also also to do with uh, control of lower limbs for example so you could have a rider that whose upper body for example in the vertical plane and in both planes actually is balanced but they're not in control of their lower legs or their leg movements and they could be touching the horse unintentionally with their spurs and so you you know you've got an issue there i mean not 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 obviously not intentionally but that is that is for me a welfare issue to the horse so that's why with that rider they have to strive to control their limbs but obviously you can't control your limbs unless you're in a, a balance at some point of that horse's gait. Uh, and, and in simple terms, to sort of just bring it back down to sort of riding skills. So in terms, the simplest way I can explain balance is if you stand on the floor and bend your knees and you don't fall over and you could move your arms, then you have a reasonable balance. The problem is if that floor, and you can try it, or no, sorry, don't try this, no, don't try this. If you do, if you take the uh, well, you know the moving escalator things in the airport, and and it keeps stopping and starting, you'll find it's a whole different ball game then, uh, and that's what horses do to us. So we can become balanced in the hold. We can get balanced in a walk where you have mostly less variability, but once you start moving into faster gates things start changing yeah. and so it's really a question to, to be honest from a riding point of view i know this is perhaps taking the question down another path but it's really a question of having the skill to rebalance yourself very quickly and then and recognizing the loss of balance in a micro way before before it gets bad that that is the skill as a rider it yeah. isn't that good riders don't lose their balance they lose their balance all the time but it's so micro and they recognize it and they can regain it that it has minimal effect on the horse. The riders that haven't got that skill, I think does have a greater effect on the horse. Yeah, brilliant. Russell, you want to come in? You're on mute, Russell. 
Thank you. I was just going to add to that, that what we believe is horses like predictability. Um, they like to be able to predict the movements of the rider. So a rider, as Richard describes, who is becomes out of balance and has the ability to be get in balance is a more favorable rider to the horse because they can predict that movement as opposed to a rider who's out of balance and then resorts to the aids, which I see a lot of being the rain. Quite often the rain is used as a balancing aid or the knee blocks become used as a balancing aid and they shorten, riders would shorten the stirrups and, and wedge their knees in. And so all of that alters that predictability for the horse to interpret from the rider. Got you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, so if we turn to some of the common issues and, and, and Tony, this is a bit of a hot potato, but in terms of weight and size, what criteria do you decide if a horse is suitable for you to ride? Well, th the thing that I've always said about rider weight is if it, if it looks wrong, it probably is wrong. So I'm looking to see whether a rider matches the horse in their size, build and structure to a large degree. Um, I was involved in the rider weight, weight, weight research that was done some time ago, and it was clearly shown that riders that were above 20% of their, their horse's body weight really did have a negative effect on the way that the horse went. And indeed, a rider above 15% of the horse's body weight, if they weren't in good balance with a well-fitting saddle, had the potential to have that effect as well go below that and, the, and they didn't seem to be affected quite as much. Although that said in the past, in, in my teaching role, I've seen riders that you would class as really quite light for their horses that have still had a very negative effect, either because they've been out of balance or very stiff. So yeah. that, that, that's a very long way of going about saying it, it, it's got to look right is the main thing. And when you talk about those weights, Tony, and those proportions, are you including the weight of the saddle? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Um, Richard, then, in terms of balance, what are the most common rider faults you see at, at, at grassroots level, but also further up the tree? Um, well, quite honestly, let, let's just start with the, I just described, if you stand on the floor and bend your knees uh, type of thing. That, I see a lot of riders when I go to, I should say, you know, low, mostly lower level uh, shows, jumping dress art shows, that actually don't have, you know, that straight line. So we, you know, we talk about the line for the, I'm just talking about the side now, the ear, shoulder, hip, pelvis, and heel, the standing on the, standing up and bending your knees line. And, uh, you know, if you stick your legs forward, that's really difficult then to control, you know, because you, you you, you would fall back, but you don't fall back. You get back to Russell's coping, your strategies, stop you falling back on that. So you, you use all your muscles to stay in balance. It's completely uneconomical way of riding. But I do see a lot of riders with their legs stuck forward. Um, and then the, the odd type of rider with, with their legs too far back, but mostly too far forward. And I was really interested uh, with uh, what Russell was saying about the two point seat, because I find in coaching, especially dressage riders, for obvious reasons, not, not jumpers, but I'm forever having to persuade them to just come out of the saddle a bit, relieve that horse's back. And mo mostly it's because the horses are not going forward enough. And, uh, and just to ease up their backs and to help the horses go forward. Um, but it is, it takes quite a lot of persuading for, I'm not talking about for riders that have started from general riding, jumping and, you know, riding across country and that sort of thing, they're not the issue. I'm talking about the ones that have started and got straight into dressage pretty early on and haven't learned to shorten their stirrups and, and get into that two point seat. Um, and they don't realise the benefits of it and the yeah. psych psychological effect on, on the horse. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent answer. Thanks, Richard. Um, Russell, you mentioned uh, saddle fit in your presentation. How often should riders get their horses saddle fit checked? Oh, gosh. Um, so I'm going to be very unpopular, but I'm going to say three to four times a year. Uh, and the reason that is, is because we know that the back changes its dimensions after 30 minutes of exercise. And if we apply a little bit of logic, let's say we have a new horse and we do some training for two months. Well, the art of the training is we should be changing its musculoskeletal system. So how can the saddle that fitted on day one 
fit the same on day 60 if your training has been sufficient yeah. and so i don't believe we have our saddles checked enough uh, if there's any saddle asymmetry and it's a whole nother webinar but if the saddle's rolling or down at the front you know you need to increase your saddle checks um, and I'm quite passionate that the saddle is that interface between the horse and the rider. If that is out of balance, then you've got other strategies taking place. But yeah, so three, four times a year, twice a year is probably minimum, um, yeah. but certainly regularly, as regularly as you can. Brilliant. Tony? Uh, I think just the thing I'd add to that as well is Russell obviously spoke about how work changes the fit there, but also with people that have their horses living out at rich grass, just the change in shape that we see through the horses through the year anyway, requires you to check it. Yeah, absolutely. Great stuff. Thank you. And then just before we move to open questions, around a couple of thoughts around correcting suboptimal rider balance. Tony, in terms of checking their balance when riding, what do you have a mental checklist that riders should run through? Well, um, when I used to teach beginner riders years ago, I very much used to try and get them to have a checklist in their own minds where I'd teach them their basic position I work on the lunge and those sorts of things. And I would literally try and get them working their way every few minutes through their own position, starting either at the top and working down or starting at the bottom and working up. And then also obviously looking at their elbows and hands. Because I think that when you get to be a rider with the skill of Richard, that becomes pretty much automatic. But certainly when riders start, they get very distracted by other things. So actually working their way through literally their whole position are my hands in the right place are my, are my heels in the right place always helps brilliant thank you um then richard are there particular exercises on or off the horse that riders can do to correct the most common rider faults in your experience well basically it's, it's posture and i think to have good posture whether you're on the floor or on a horse I think it comes down to exactly what Tony was saying. First of all, developing um, body awareness. You know, where is my head now? Or is it slightly tilted to the left? And haven't I not noticed that? Or is it now in the middle? And so you can do all these kind of things. I mean, obviously, Pilates and all of this kind of stuff increases body awareness. But I think to have a practical effect as a rider, you need to be clear about this body awareness that you haven't got awareness of it. And I've tried, you know, over the years, trying to help riders that have not got the fact that it's their body and it's their awareness they've got to have. It's no good how many times I can tell them, you know, they're dropping their left shoulder down. It, it, if you don't feel it as a rider and you're not aware of it, it's not gonna work. But by the time you've done exactly what Tony has said, concentrated on all these other things you have to do when you ride a horse. So body awareness and then, Flowing from that, I think there's small controls over the body. Um, but, you know, let, let's also be clear. Um, Russell spoke about the, the rotational aspect of the horse's spine and body and whole th thorax and all of the horse as, as it moves along. And especially in canter, it's a, it's a, a very movable feast that we're doing. And as much as we're talking about um, you know, sort of alignment, you also have to synchronize with the horse yeah. and your pelvis and the mobility of your lower spine as a rider, very important that you can, your pelvis synchronizes with the horse's movement, not, not just on the side it's from the back to the front, but actually in the dynamics of it, because it's a dynamic activity we're talking about. And yeah. You know, I, I'm not saying that's easy, but that's that's also an element that we, you know, when when I think in improving your position and getting it started, all of those kind of things off the horse, even using mechanical horses, all of that helps. Uh, but then you have to transfer it, and it has to be dynamic. And as I as I've said, um, with the moving uh, staircase thing, but for to give you an example, um, when I get on an airport bus. I try not to hold on to the, you know, the railings and all the rest of it. And I, it, I want to test my balance. And it, depending on the driver, whether he's going fast, slow, puts his foot on the brake and all the rest of it, uh, that helps me understand where my regaining of balance is and, uh, you know, and all, all of the core strength that you need to do that. 
Um, but that is one of the things that you can transfer. Yeah. You know, your, but it's the dynamic element that is difficult. Love it. Also, a very COVID secure way of travelling on the bus if you're not touching anything. I, I, very, excellent. You can um, make friends very quickly. By... <laughs> <laughs> um, and you, your talk of Pilates, uh, Pippa Funnel, who's on our webinar in two weeks, I'm sure to move her Pilates class to, to be able to, to come and join us at our webinar. So it's yeah, very important. Um, Russell, final question in this section. Are there any apps that help riders to ride in better balance? Um, I think... Yeah, there are apps there. There's, I think, uh, videoing apps that can help, um, you know, just simple split screen technology. So you can video yourself on the left and right rein. I think they're, they're very user friendly or you could just use your iPhone or your other um, device to just video. I think Richard highlighted the point there that you could be saying to someone you're dropping your left shoulder a um, hundred times, but until they see it and uh, then it changes the pathway of that information. So for me, we there are some several apps um, available um, but actually just using a video can just help improve the rider's position uh, significantly and I think just to add on to Richard's point it's the dynamics that we've got to improve that dynamic stability um, it's all very well getting riders sitting correct posture on a static platform but actually that's no use we need to actually get the riders um, posture correct on a dynamic platform um, and for me, that comes either gym balls, simulators um, and targeted pos postural exercises on a horse. Brilliant. Listen, thank you. And thank you to everyone who's uh, put in questions. We've got lots. So if, if the team can sort of keep the answers nice and tight. Um, and if you see the question that you, you were going to answer, please do upvote them. Very simple to do so. Um, so, uh, Tony, I'll, I'll come to you first. Uh, James mm -hmm. asked a question. Does the fact that most riders mount from the left have any bearing on rider symmetry or not in the saddle? Well, I, I can remember in the old days, we, we did used to be asked to mount from both sides on a fairly regular basis. I think that um, if a rider uses a mounting block, as I believe they should do nowadays, then that has probably reduced the effect. But certainly riders mounting from the ground, I would suspect could, could have an effect. I think Russell would probably be able to co comment better than I can on that one. Yeah, we, we did a study in 2007, I think, where we looked at different mountain block heights from the ground, low block, high block. And certainly, as uh, has already been mentioned, a high block is far better for the horse. Um, but we also looked at rider fitness and looked at their thigh length. And we found rider fitness, the fitter the rider, the lower the pressures um, beneath the saddle when mounting. And like to give you an idea of the pressures when mounting from the ground, they were higher than a horse landing over one meter 30. So, uh -huh. yeah, so they were astronomical to the right of the wither when mounting from the ground. So summary, high mounting block uh, where possible, um, it well, is essential and mounting from the other side, but still need a high mounting block. Um, thank you, Russell. And I'll, I'll stick with you for Rochelle's question. Do you know if those riders were all left or right handed and do you sus suspect a connection? I think that was in relation to to your to your yeah. presentation. earlier. So we in the seat study, they were all right handed uh, in the other studies. They were all right handed, too. But I'm also working um, with uh, the International Task Force on Laterality in Sports Horses. It's a, a global uh, team of researchers where we are looking particularly at what we call laterality so this sidedness are horses left-handed or right-handed or and right-handed and what effect does a rider have on those interactions so that's a question that is something we're looking at about how horses have preferences and how the rider's preferences have an effect brilliant International Task Force on Laterality in Sport Horses. You can't say that when you've had a couple I of know, days. I know, it's <laughs> awful. Um, 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 Richard, this is a great question from Sarah. What can be done if a, the lack of symmetry is due to rider injury? Sarah has a young horse and she doesn't want it to be affected by her own injury. Okay, um, this is not uncommon uh, and I'm going to give the same answer that I give to everybody. Uh, I'm not the specialist on that. I think you need to take advice from a physio um, because they know what they, they will know about particular injuries, you know, whether you've got metal screws in here, there and everywhere. And uh, they will be able to advise what is possible to 
within a range of movement to get back to the to a reasonable i mean let's be clear i don't think there is a symmetrical human being out there oh, i'm the same with horses and by the time the farriers have got them i think they're all going everywhere so we're not starting and i don't think it's possible or even pre preferable to try to get that perfect symmetry we've got to deal with what we've got and you know to uh, to give you an example you know i'm in awe of our of our para riders or all para riders with their kind of asymmetries that that they can have and and look what they can achieve so i don't think you should think that it's going to stop you it's great that you want to do the best for your horse and that's going to be you need to get advice from a physio thank or, you or, or a specialist in, in that yeah brilliant um, Tony, Lauren's asked, how can we make ourselves more symmetrical? Now, this actually relates just to what uh, Richard said. There, you know, there's no some, there's no perfect symmetry in horses or humans. But obviously, we want to make ourselves as symmetrical as possible. What, 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 what advice can we give Lauren? I think, I think the awareness that we were talking about and the use of your, your mental checklist can certainly help. Um, the thing that amazes me very often when I help riders is that almost every riding school you go into nowadays has mirrors and they'll quite happily ride around peering at their horse's head trying to work out what position it's in but not actually take a good glance of themselves in the mirror both going towards it and crossing at the side of it. Um, I think that as well all, all of the exercises that we've already mentioned I, I also do Pilates and I, and I was not good actually in the terms of supple mess before Pilates that has made a huge difference to me over the last couple of years. Brilliant what night do you do Pilates then? Thursday nights. Uh, excellent uh, Richard you want to come in there? Yeah I just want to come back because um, I don't know whether we can see Lauren on the screen but Lauren are you sitting in your chair mm. with your head upright <laughs> or are you sitting like Roly was just a few seconds ago? Now he's shifting around, you see, because <laughs> the truth about it is this. It is posture. And it is soft tissue, obviously skeletal. But if we spend X amount of hours, you know, which is understandable, we all do, slumping around and leaning against the car door as we drive and all the rest of it, how likely is it that we are going to sit on a horse like that? It's not likely it's more unlikely. So I'm not, I, I, you know, to, to be serious, and I think about this myself, the more often you can be aware of your posture and sit, then the more chance there is to be n nearer to the symmetrical goal that we're all striving to achieve. But we won't put Lauren on, on the screen now, so we can- Well, there, you've embarrassed me instead of Lauren, which is marvellous. <laughs> Rolling, I want to say this uh, in support of um, Russell, uh, could you just sit up, Roly, a minute? Because I just want to show everybody. Can you see what a fantastic jumper Roly has got a nice <laughs> strike there? Now, Tony, you're on it straight away. If you were having a lesson with me, I'd say that's a great jumper because now we can see from the back and the front whether you're doing this, that, and the other. So, everybody, you could go and buy a jumper like Roly. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'll leave you to that. Or you, for Christmas, you could buy one of Russell's uh, jacket things come don't be shy now Russell you've got the lines here I mean I used to seriously and you anybody can do this you can just get electric tape and put it across but much better it all falls off in the end buy one of Russell's uh, jacket things you can explain where they get them from Russell <laughs> I'm glad you're not in the marketing team buy one of Russell's jacket <laughs> <things. laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, donation on all the sales <laughs> um i just wanted to add in there not thank you richard for that but uh, just going back to what richard was saying about the therapist i think there's something we mustn't neglect here is the effect the horse has on the rider and that is so so important we can be sitting really square and symmetrical and you get on a horse as i described that pushes more with one hind limb to the other that will have an effect on the rider's position. And yes, we must talk to the rider physiotherapist, but we must include the equine team because it is that complex interaction. And yeah. you can have a symmetrical rider on horse A and they get onto a horse B that has saddle slip because of a locomotor asymmetry and they're crooked. Is that a rider effect or a horse effect? And we need to make sure we target all aspects and not just the rider or the horse independently.
absolutely ride a horse and saddle that's it yeah. the career isn't it um brilliant thank you russell for that um th there's a question that comes through on facebook um russell to you would you recommend two point in canter this lady can well no but this person competes in endurance and rides two point at canter which has always been a traditional position in endurance but more people now are tending to sit in the canter over the longer distances and 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 they'd be interested to hear your thoughts and influence of these positions at canter yeah, so as I mentioned in the talk, we, we've looked at elite show jumping horses and we found that the two point position was associated with more symmetry in trot. Um, obviously, we can't look at symmetry so much in canter, but we are seeing a change in back movement. We've got another uh, 20 horses that we've analysed in canter and we see the same trend in a change in back movement when you're in two point position. The saddle pressures reduce when we're in two point position, they, the saddle location alters. So I am fairly confident that two point, adopting a two point position in trot and canter has a locomotor benefit to the horse across all disciplines. So we've got dressage horses that have shown the same trend. We've got jumping horses, haven't done um, endurance horses, but I think having that rider in more better balance allows the horse to optimize its own symmetry. Um, so that's our current area of research. So I can maybe come on in a couple of years time and update because we've got some forced data coming, um, update you in a couple of years time. But certainly at the moment from I think now over 30, 40 horses, um, there seems to be a trend of improved symmetry and improved dynamic stability of the ver vertebral column or the back. Brilliant, thank you. Well, we'll certainly invite you back and it'll almost certainly be before two years. Yeah. Um, but Tony, there's a, qu a question on Facebook. Is the influence of the horse on the rider greater than the rider on the horse, given the size of the horse and increased forces it can generate? That might be one more for Russell, but what, what's your, what are your initial thoughts there, Tony? Um, I think it would very much depend on the horse, to be perfectly honest. I, th I think that um, certain horses in the way that they move and the way that they behave could have a very dramatic influence on the rider. But if you had a horse that is generally calm in its movement and already established and going forward, then the rider would be having more influence on the horse. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you for that, Tony. Um, Richard, Janice has asked, so how does the average rider test if their horse is already asymmetric and whether when they're off the horse or um so how, how if, if if your horse is asymmetric how can you tell that it's asymmetric okay i'm going to divert this straight to russell because he's the expert in that um so you've done a lot of work with this uh, russell so simple what can you do at home yeah, I, th I think I'm going to divert it to the rider's home team, actually. And, you know, it needs to come from a physical point of view. Is the horse asymmetric structurally? That's things we want to know about. There are things we could do. You could get five carrots, put one on the floor each time and watch how the horse eats. Chances are he will have a habitual way of positioning his forelimbs. One forelimb will be forward, one forelimb will be upright. And that will then give you asymmetric front feet follow that up, that will give you asymmetric scapular positions. So there's lots of things you could do like that, but I'm a really big fan of teamwork. Talk to your physio, talk to your therapist, understand your horse's body, its physiolog phys physiology, um, and then from there you can make a picture yourself. But could yeah. we can just finish that one up? I mean, so you obviously, as you said, you can stand behind your horse and you mm -hmm. look at what we, call the point of hips, the hips, yeah. of hips and, and see where they are obviously they're also going to be on flat ground for this yeah and you can see about limb the limb length in front yeah take a point and, and sort of look at that but what i wanted to come back to is my same point about asymmetrical riders you know don't let it stop you don't let it inhibit you try to become more symmetrical i've had and i've bought many asymmetrical horses i don't mind disclosing that now the horse that i rode in the london olympics had an asymmetrical pelvis all disclosed and when we vetted it and we all the rest of it it was one of, it was a very successful horse obviously to get to the olympics uh, and we knew that, and as Russell said, we got all our team, our farriers, the saddle fitters, 
all the rest of it. And we worked around that. And, and the horse, you know, stayed sound and performed well, and is still sound, but, um, you know, as in pain free. So uh, it, it, it's all doable. Yeah. And I, I was just going to add there, I think we mustn't be scared by asymmetry, but we must be aware of it. If you're aware of it, you can support the horse. And that's the key bit. We need to support the horse's own asymmetries, just like we're all asymmetrical. Um, and if we can support the horse, then we can help manage it. And that's a lovely segue into Anne's question, which I'll give to Tony, but he might divert back to Russell. Uh, would you fit a saddle to compensate for rider asymmetry or for symmetry? I think that there are times when the saddle, and, and Russell may correct me here, needs to be fitted for the asymmetry initially, but then it needs to be readjusted on a very regular basis as the horse's muscles develop. Yeah, You're nodding I, there, Russell. Yeah, I uh, completely agree. But again, this is another discussion where you need to discuss with your saddle fitter. And, you know, it's on a very specific basis. If depending what the rider asymmetry is, may lend an adjustment to the saddle. I think you've got to be really clear. We've got the underside of the saddle and the upper side of the saddle. So we can adjust the upper side of the saddle for a significant asymmetry, but the underside of the saddle still has to conform to the shape of the horse's back and distribute the forces. So I think there's two parts to the saddle that you possibly could discuss with your saddle fitter. Um, but as Tony said, regular saddle checks are absolutely essential. Can I just give a practical, you know, what we did with, our, with those horses that I rode that were quite asymmetrical. Um, I've given Russell a plug, so I don't mind now moving on to the plugs. Everybody probably <laughs> knows the saddles I ride in. Don't worry, Roly, I won't mention it. Just Google it. But the reason I ride in them is that the, they're air-filled, uh, uh, not totally, but almost uh, with foam. And so for asymmetrical horses, it's very easy to adjust, put a little bit more air in, put a bit more air out, and you can get, as, as Russell was saying, that underneath, the underside of it um, adjusted to the to the part of the horse because you can divide it from the front to the back and from side to side and the other reason we've talked about the or, or Russell talked about the functionality of the horse the other reason I have those is that when a horse moves its foreleg forward in protraction its scapula comes a little bit further back underneath the saddle that for me is the only functional part that the saddle in, impedes upon and i like that scapula to be able to the top of it uh, to move freely underneath it uh, so i haven't mentioned the name really there so excellent good man um, russell thank you uh, thank you richard um russell a, a question from facebook sitting trot is encouraged by most coaches for improving seat and balance but is this having a considerable detrimental impact on the horse so I'm going to be quite bold here and I'm going to say, yes, I believe it can do. Um, we know sitting trot can in increase the pressures beneath the saddle. Now, if you've got someone who's skilled, they can sit in phase with the horse as the horse's back goes down and comes up. The rider follows the movements of the horse. Now, that's a different scenario. If we've got a rider that is bouncing, so they're asynchronized with the horse, then that is a detrimental effect and what the rider will do is they will use the reins and what you often see is riders leaning behind the vertical because they haven't got the core stability and to withstand these forces coming up um, so the rider will develop a strategy at the same time the horse is having to withstand this movement so sitting trot is really useful if it is performed correctly um, and so I, the way I would coach my riders is sit for five strides and then off again, go rising. So you reduce the amount you're sitting to get better and, and then extend that time. But I, I'm a big fan of get the riders off the horse and get them on a gym ball, get them bouncing, get them feeling that movement, that displacement mm. and how they manage that with their trunk. So to answer your question, I think sitting trot is good, but done incorrectly. Yes, I think it has a detrim detrimental effect on the horse. Excellent, thank you. Richard, a question from Janet. Interesting to see how rider asymmetry affects horse movements. Uh, Janet's had a knee replacement and is forced to ride with one stirrup, one hole longer on the right. How do you, do you think this will affect her horse in the long term? 
Um, again, I think he, she should discuss this with her saddle fitter to see what can be done with that. Um, again, I, I think, you know, uh, as Russell said, horses can cope. Uh, the, the, this is why they're such marvellous animals and they can cope with it. And I think, you know, with her together with her coach, they should work around it. So, yeah, lots of people have have these issues. And if as long as you work around it and you work with your whole team, I, I, I don't see any problem. Brilliant. Russell? Yeah, I, I agree with Richard. Uh, the only thing I just want to add in here is we've just got to check, is it an actual limb length difference? Um, we've looked at, that we've done a study where we looked at making stirrups asymmetrical. And if you if your limbs are the same length uh, with a two centimeter variation and you're riding asymmetrically, then you have a risk of pushing your pelvis to one side. So yes, ride as you are for your knee replacement. But I think first of all, we need to see is your limb actually the same? Are your limbs actually the same length? Or is it a function that your knee is stiffer and you're preferring to go shorter? Uh, if that's the latter, then I would be slightly cautious at what effect it's happening, having to the upper part of the body. Yeah, brilliant, thanks. Tony? Um, just to say, I, I, I did for quite a while coach a rider who, who did have a very definite difference in the length of her legs. And unfortunately in the past, previous coaches had done everything they can could to try and get her to ride level. And that was completely disrupting her position. It was throwing her over to one side. She was collap collapsing on the other purely because she was trying to compensate for this uneven leg length. The second we actually said, no, it's fine to have your stirrup. I think it was actually two holes shorter on the left-hand side. It evened everything up and the horse went beautifully. Yeah. Interesting. And I think, if, 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 sorry to add, if there's any listeners on this call tonight uh, and they suspect they have a limb length difference, go and get it checked. Because if it is an actual limb length difference, then as Tony's described, there are options. Um, and if it's not an actual limb length difference, i.e. there's a rotation, then that can be dealt with in a different way. So it's so important to, to get it verified clinically. And, yeah. and Roly, what we should mention is that, you know, this has got to be discussed with the surgeon. And I, I think people have got to start looking out for these. If they're going to have a new hip, you can get now these new hips, they're dressage hips, and they really help with the sitting trot. So ask uh it, well the product hasn't come to market yet russell and i have yet to design it <laughs> we're going to design hip replacements that really help with your sitting trot and we'll do the same with knees well okay, yeah, come back in two years time we'll yeah. be, have it all sort of no problem <laughs> <laughs> um eleanor's uh, russell asked an interesting question have studies been done looking at the pressures on the horse during side saddle Oh, um, yes. And this is one of my pandemic papers that I need to finish writing. Um, yeah, we did a group of horses, uh, side saddle compared to astride, astride um, and the paper will be out in the next couple of years. So, yes. And um, there is two other papers that have done, looked at this, too. Well, in the next couple of years, it's going to be very busy, isn't it? Um, d d Richard, um, someone on Facebook has asked, and um, is there... If there is a horse with kissing spines, can balance affect the horse when you ride them? Um, some, many horses have, again, to what you classify, you're the rolling, as kissing spines, but how, you know, uh, spinous process is quite close or touching. And some, it doesn't really bother them or it doesn't apparently, you know, bother them and some it does. Uh, and the ones that do, obviously have more more not to desired movements they can suddenly dip their backs down or even arch, arch their backs up a little bit and so the the ones that I, I think this is a you know something to be discussed really with the vet because it's an individual basis yeah but just again it comes back to just because your horse might have vertebral processes quite close do not think that that means it's going to be difficult or in inhibiting. It might be, it might not. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. Um, we, we are almost winding up. Tony, I'm going to ask this to you, but I imagine Russell will jump in as well. Uh, great question on Facebook. Is a horse that has multiple riders, all with their own imbalances, worse or better off than a horse that just has one rider with the same imbalance? 
Wow. <laughs> I, oh, I, I guess it depends on how imbalanced those riders are and whether their imbalances are the, directed in the same way. If, if, if one rider is slightly crooked to the left, but the other is slightly crooked to the right, you could argue that it possibly evens it up a bit. Um, but but if the riders are badly crooked and all in the same direction, then it's going to be a very negative effect. I'm sure Russell can add a bit more to that. Yeah, I think I don't think we know experimentally yet. This is something I'm trying to look at um, as we speak. But when we look at our riding school horses, if you look at them, they have to manage multiple riders of different shapes, sizes, abilities. And those riding school horses are amazing because they develop a very different strategy, locomotive strategy compared to our private horses. So I think those horses adjust to that by shortening their stride length. They go stiffer. They don't move their backs as much. Um, but uh, so I think they have a strategy. But in the context of if we've got our private horse with different riders on um, different rider positions, then the horse will have to develop that strategy. Now, whether it undoes those asymmetries, I don't know, but he'll develop a strategy for each rider. Brilliant. Listen, thank you so much. I, I don't know where the last hour and a half has gone. It's, it's flown by and I, I've loved it. We could go on all night, but um, I'll get told off. So um, just wanted to, we, we, as ever, lots and lots of ground covered. Uh, Tony, from your perspective, what, what's the, the key take home message uh, that, you, that you've come to the conclusion on? Well, I, Russell has mentioned a couple of times that horses develop a strategy to deal with the rider. And I think that riders need to be very aware of their balance and imbalance to ensure that the horse is not given too difficult a task. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. Richard, what, what are your final thoughts? Sure, well, I loved uh, Russell's presentation. Um, but I suppose the thing I would say is uh, don't let these things inhibit you or, or stop you trying to get better or enjoying your, your, your horse riding and, and training. And just remember, it's not actually about keeping your balance. The skill is regaining your balance when you've lost it and actually predicting where, how a horse might, might move. And, and, and if you can predict those movements, you can predict he's going to stick his head down and have a little bit of a buck then get your backside out of the saddle just as russell has mentioned with the two points in and you will stay in balance if you sit your backside on the saddle when the horse is trying to arch its back you will lose your balance so learn all these things uh, but it is the dynamic it's the experience of a dynamic saddle and a dynamic horse underneath you that and the re rebalancing that we that makes us successful or not in influencing the horse Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. And Russell, what are your final thoughts? I think I think um, it's already been summarised, really. But just don't if you for me, be proactive in trying to understand the asymmetries that the horse has and the rider has and work as a team to try and manage those asymmetries. We are asymmetrical. Horses are asymmetrical and it's not a problem. But if we need to understand them so we can manage them. And I think that's really my passion is just trying to look at all the little detail um, and how can we do it better as I said at the, at the end of my presentation so um, you know these animals can feel a fly they can you know you get on my shoulders and you're crooked how will I cope and the horse is the same and it's just trying to understand that and and be a bit proactive in trying to manage it and you know that's us included as you've already mentioned Pilates off horse exercises transferring that onto the horse to be aware of our position on the horse Love it. Thank you, Russell. And listen, thank you to everyone for your questions. Um, we've got through more than half. Um, so thank you for that. And I'm, I'm really sorry that we haven't been able to get through them all, but I hope it's given you a really good flavour about the importance of rider balance and how we can uh, improve ourselves as riders, but also consider the horse uh, and the saddle as well. Um, remember, if you've got th topics that you think we should cover in future webinars, then do um, email us on education at World, World Horse Welfare dot org remember next 
uh, Thursday, Remembrance Day, is the uh, World's Health Welfare Annual Conference, whose opinion matters, um, and we, we, we've, we'll share another link uh, around how you can register for that. And our next webinar in two weeks' time, um, Pippa Funnel, fresh from her, from her Pilates class, uh, will be joining us on how to resist peer pressure and do what's right for your horse. So thank you so much for joining us and a special thank you to Tony, to Richard, um, it would have been brilliant to have you, um, and to Russell especially, lime green and all, it was fantastic. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and remember, you, you're available to play back this whole webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, look forward to seeing you in two weeks time. In the meantime, take great care and thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.